in today's lecture, uh, we will look at the development of uh, aircraft engines using the piston cylinder concept of IC engines using various uh, considerations of thermodynamics and uh, various other mechanical engineering issues that needed to be all put together to make uh, aircraft power plants. First, we will deal with various issues that are related to uh, basic IC engines starting with uh, thermodynamics, which we did in the last class. And we shall see how all these uh, fundamental sciences and certain amount of mechanical engineering is put together into making of engines that finally, go on to fly the aircraft. The various uh, thermodynamic issues that need to be considered, uh, much of it has been dealt with in the earlier lectures. The cycle considerations that need to be uh, looked into and uh, as we have discussed all engines and the engines that we are talking about are the heat engines need to be based on thermodynamic cycles uh, and we will look at some of these thermodynamic cycle issues uh, once again. And then we will look into the various mechanical engineering issues that need to be uh, put together along with the thermodynamic uh, issues uh, to create aircraft engines. The IC engines or the piston engines as they are more popularly called uh, are quite often uh, the main source of power plant in aircraft for literally thousands of aircraft over the last 100 years. And even today, literally hundreds, probably thousands of aircraft are still flying around with uh, engines or aircraft power plant based on piston engines. These are the small aircraft, uh, which make, uh, which are flown by small engines. And we shall have a look at some of these engines uh, today and how these engines are actually uh, put together, created and put together to uh, fly aircraft. We started with talking about cycles. Now, we look at the cycles all over again to see and, and that is where we start again from to build up our uh, engines. Now, we had a look at the uh, con concept of cycle uh, both in uh, P V diagram as well as in T S diagram and let us have a quick look at uh, that all over again. Uh, we have seen that if you have uh, let us say two different cycles, ideal cycles at this moment, let us uh, just uh, consider simple ideal cycles. If you have two different cycles uh, given by let us say 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 and then the other one which is 17891. If the two cycles are doing same amount of work from both the uh, cycle considerations, uh, we can write down that uh, the work done uh, by both of them may be same, but the work input requirement in case of uh, one cycle is uh, is more than the other and as a result and the work, work output also is uh, different from uh, what the two cycles. Uh, the result is that the cycle 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, actually has more work uh, heat input and more heat output. However, when you consider the efficiency the efficiency of the cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 is actually less than the efficiency of the cycle 1, 7, 8, 9, 1. Uh, now, this comes from the efficiency definition, which we have done in the last class. If we look at the uh, P V diagram or uh, again, we will look at the work done. Now, we had seen that there are two legs of the cycle where the work is done. One is of course, the what we call the power stroke during which the work is extracted from the engine and the other is the compression stroke in which the work is actually put inside the engine. And in this we can see here that the work is being put in and work is being taken out from both the cycles. Uh, in terms of the 
basic consideration that we have seen that the two cycles are supposed to do same work. So, for both the cases uh, q 1 minus q 2 is actually equal to w 1 minus w 2. So, that the net uh, work uh, done is equal to the net heat that is gone into the system and that is same for both the cycles. However, as we have just seen that the efficiency of one of the cycles that is 17891 is actually more than the efficiency of the cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, 1. Now, this brings us to the point that you may have two cycles with same work output, but the efficiency of one is could be better than the other one. That means, the efficiency translated to uh, fuel efficiency, it would mean that one cycle would actually consume less fuel uh, than the other one uh, doing same amount of work. Now, that is obviously a very attractive thing for any engine maker. Now, if we look at the uh, a schematic of the piston that we have here and we have discussed this in the last class. Uh, Let us look at it again quickly. We have this piston stroke and during which you would need to perform the uh, work. So, when the piston is uh, you know moving in, it is actually doing the compression work and when it is uh, forced out, that is the power stroke. Now, uh, what happens is if you are to do uh, work out of more work out of this piston, uh, you would need to uh, change you know the volume of this and we will we'll come to the actual uh, formula in a few minutes. The point is that if you are to create more uh, efficiency of one cycle, you would need to create more compression ratio as we have seen in the last uh, uh, lecture. Uh, the efficiency thermal efficiency is directly dependent on the compression ratio and which means that one of them has a higher compression ratio than the other which means the process 1 7 actually is executing a higher compression ratio uh, than the process 1 2 and that is the source of the higher efficiency. Now, to create higher compression ratio this piston has to move more. That means, the uh, length of the stroke would have to be more and this would require the piston to be of a larger size. Okay. So, if you want more compression ratio, more efficiency which translates to more fuel efficiency uh, and fuel conservation, uh, you would need to probably have a piston uh, which has a longer uh, stroke length. Now, this is something which comes out of the basic consideration of thermodynamics uh, as seen from simple ideal cycle analysis. Now, this means that you would require a piston which is of larger size or, or a longer in length to obtain higher efficiency. Now, this is a bit of a problem that in aircraft, if you are looking at uh, anything that has to go on a flying aircraft the size and weight are uh, restrained. They are premium and uh, because anything that you carry in an aircraft would have to be compensated for by creating more thrust. So, larger size and higher weight are something that are severely restricted whenever an engine is being considered for uh, aircraft. Uh, this is one of the reasons why for example, uh, the aircraft uh, do not use diesel engine, which as you know are uh, uh, higher uh, in weight, uh, because of the fact that they operate under higher compression ratio and those compression ratios do give the diesel engine higher efficiency. So, conclusion from the earlier slide that you can go for a higher compression ratio, uh, if we move towards a diesel engine, it could become unacceptable to the aircraft uh, designer because the diesel engines are typically uh, heavier and would not be uh, uh, carried in an aircraft uh, in a uh, efficient manner uh, taking the aircraft as a whole. So, even the engine is more efficient the aircraft as a whole would become an inefficient device. So, that is one of the considerations. The other is of course, that the size limitation if you have a, a larger piston sizes the size of the a uh, whole uh, engine would tend to go up and as we have seen before and we shall see again today. Uh, 
that uh, you know the total size of all the cylinders put together make up the whole engine, uh, which means that uh, that there is a restriction on the total number of cylinders that you can put, the total sizes of each cylinder that can go on an aircraft because finally, whatever goes on an aircraft has to meet the aircraft shape. The shape of the aircraft is very important to make it uh, airworthy and as a result of which there is a restriction in the size of the piston uh, length and the cylinder volume that can go on an aircraft. Uh, such limitations of course, are normally not there in land based vehicles. So, land based vehicles quite often can go on for uh, higher efficiency uh, using a heavier or a larger uh, engines. So, as a result of these uh, restrictions, the work done per uh, cylinder in a piston engine that goes on an aircraft uh, tends to get somewhat limited. And this limitation is what uh, aircraft engine designers uh, have to uh, live with. Now, as a result of the fact that uh, to make an aircraft fly, you need certain aggregate amount of power and to use this aggregate amount of power, uh, you need to then put together a number of cylinders. Uh, so, that the aggregate amount of power is quite uh, sufficient to meet the requirements of aircraft uh, thrust requirement. So, uh, the power of reciprocating engine uh, as we know is proportional to the volume of the combined pistons and quite often many of the IC engines or piston engines uh, you may have heard uh, often is uh, you know uh, referred to or uh, uh, cited as so much of volume and th that is because the volume does represent the work capacity of that particular engine. The other thing that uh, 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 required in an aircraft is a light weight. Uh, anything that goes on an aircraft has to be uh, as light as possible and as a result of which many of the piston engines uh, very quickly started getting made of uh, aluminum alloys which were developed specifically for uh, the aircraft grade. So, the aircraft grade aluminum alloys were developed uh, of which the aircraft uh, engines were made, uh, which are quite often not used in the land based vehicles. So, uh, both in terms of uh, the way the engines are uh, designed and created and then the way they are made uh, needed to be developed differently. Uh, for aircraft engines. Uh, this is something which happened probably more than 40 or 50 or uh, 60 years back and as a result of which most of the aircraft engines today are much lighter than corresponding uh, and much smaller than corresponding engines used in land based vehicles. Let us take a quick look again at some of the uh, arrangements that are quite often done in various kinds of uh, aircraft engines, which often tend to be uh, multi cylinder engines, and as we have seen, the multi cylinder is often arrived at by putting together the total amount of work that is necessary to drive the propeller, which of course creates a thrust that flies the aircraft. Now, as we have seen, the number of cylinder arrangements, uh, let us quickly look at it again. Uh, you can have uh, uh, cylinders lined up one after another in what is known as the inline version, where they are one after another. Uh, the other version is where you can uh, put two uh, cylinders in a V formation and then you can have a V in line. So, you can have two by two uh, uh, cylinders lined up or you could have X type where four cylinders are around one. Uh, central uh, main shaft or crank shaft and uh, then you can have a four in line which means you can have multiples of four four or eight uh, just like you had multiples of two which means two four six eight etc however there are uh, options where you can have four cylinders in this fashion which is often referred to as h type so that uh, uh, four cylinders are arranged in an opposed fashion and not in x type okay and uh, and the other possibility is if you have odd number of cylinders depending on the as i mentioned earlier uh, 
the aggregate amount of power that is required finally, to uh, drive the propeller. Uh, if you land up with a number that is 5 or for example, 7 or 9 uh, and if the aircraft shape uh, accommodates it quite often one of the uh, arrangements is referred to as the radial arrangement, where you have 5 or 7 or even up to 9 cylinders arranged uh, radially around the central crankshaft. So, all these uh, uh, pistons uh, supply power to a central crankshaft except now in this case as you can see here you would need a ra large uh, diameter to accommodate all these engines. Okay. So, the point here is that each of these as you can see have different kind of final shape. This would have one kind of shape, this would need another kind of shape, this has a different kind of shape and this of course, has a different kind of shape the outer shape I am talking about right now the outer shape within which all these cylinders are arranged, because this outer shape has to conform to the aircraft body inside which this engine is going to be housed. So, the uh, final arrangement is quite often decided by two considerations. One is the aggregate amount of power that is required to uh, drive the propeller which finally, flies the aircraft. The other consideration is the shape of the aircraft in which this arrangement is going to go inside, uh, whether it can accommodate this arrangement uh, is the other consideration. So, these two put together finally, create uh, the aircraft engine which goes inside a aircraft. As we have seen in the uh, earlier one, each of these uh, pistons actually operate under uh, a particular thermodynamic cycle. Uh, thermodynamic cycle is the uh, basis on which uh, these uh, each of these pistons is actually working. Uh, however, uh, what happens is that uh, since they are all uh, supplying power to the same central crankshaft, it becomes necessary to supply power to the crankshaft almost on a continuous basis and to do that the mechanical engineering requirement uh, requires that the power supply stroke or what we call the power stroke needs to be time staggered. So, each of these cylinders are now uh, operated in such a manner that the power stroke of those cylinders do not occur uh, simultaneously, they are time staggered. Let us quickly go back to the earlier one. If you can see here for example, uh, this diagram, uh, the cylinders as you can see here uh, are at different positions okay? and uh, you know these two are more or less at same position, whereas these two are more or less at same position. So, uh, the power stroke of these two are probably uh, time together, whether, whereas the power stroke of these two cylinders are probably time together. So, whereas in X type as you can see each of them has a different uh, 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 stroking arrangement. So, the strokes are essentially staggered in time, so that the supply to the central crankshaft occurs uh, in a time staggered manner, so that almost at every split second there is a power stroke being supplied to the main crankshaft. Now, this is the mechanical arrangement which needs to be uh, uh, created when you have a multi cylinder uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, especially uh, most of the aircraft engines do have multi cylinder arrangement, even though each and every of these cylinders is actually operating under same thermodynamic cycle. Let us take a look at now, how the piston uh, engines actually create power in terms of actual operation. We had seen how they uh, can be uh, put together in terms of thermodynamic considerations. Now, we can look at it from pure mechanical considerations. The power created or you know as we said the power stroke is directly proportional to the, uh, the average pressure uh, that is applied on this piston uh, by the length of the, uh, the piston stroke okay, and the area okay, uh, and that into n by 2 n is of course, the r p m. Uh, and n by 2 is the power stroke per minute. 
So, uh, these parameters put together uh, L p into a the f uh, that of course, is the volume through which the piston is displaced. So, that is the displacement volume of the piston and as I mentioned earlier is often referred to as one of the specifications of uh, every engine and that uh, multiplied by the piston. So, that of course, gives you the force and that into the uh, uh, rotation gives you the power per unit uh, time. Now, uh, this uh, of course, tells you that uh, if you have a longer uh, piston stroke, you get more power. If you have a bigger area of the piston, uh, you get more power. If you have a higher mean effective pressure, you can get more power or if you uh, run the if you can afford to or if you are in a position to run the engine at a higher rpm you can get more power now let's look at these number uh, these parameters quickly again we have just seen that in an aircraft engine uh, you cannot there are size restrictions there are weight restrictions so you cannot have a large uh, piston stroke you cannot have a large piston you cannot have a large piston area because of the size restriction. So, those two get automatically uh, restricted by their uh, requirement of the aircraft. Uh, they have to be restricted. The pressure uh, gets a little restricted because of the fact that if you have a very high pressure, a very, very high pressure, this piston would have to be built uh, with very heavy material and that is what is normally done for example, in a diesel engine which is made of uh, very thick uh, uh, material uh, to withstand the very high pressure that is normally created in a diesel engine. So, the pressure is has some restriction otherwise this have to be the, the whole piston cylinder would have to be built like a uh, pressure vessel. So, uh, all these restrictions put together the aircraft engine need to be uh, designed or created. The fourth possibility which we have here is the RPM. So, most of the aircraft engines do operate at somewhat high RPM, so that the power created is of a reasonable amount and it sufficient to drive the propeller that creates the thrust. And as a result, the power strokes that are created would have to be very fast. So, this is the aircraft engine uh, requirement that you cannot have high uh, length of the piston stroke, you cannot have large area, and those are restricted. You cannot have very high pressures uh, because of the uh, limitation on the weight, but you can go for a somewhat higher uh, rpm and as a result most of the aircraft engines do operate at a somewhat higher rpm than many of the land based uh, engines. And hence, we can say that the, the ideal work that is done by an engine and this IHP is something which can be also configured from the uh, uh, P V diagram or which is often uh, sometimes referred to in many books as indicator diagram, which comes from the thermodynamic cycle diagram of a pressure volume uh, diagram. Uh, you can get uh, the amount of work uh, from that diagram and that would have to be equal to the work done as we have written down above and this is now expressed in terms of the volume and this is the volume of the cylinder and as I mentioned quite often cylinder volume is mentioned in the specification of the engine as an indicator of its work done. And uh, capital N C is the number of cylinders. Now, that tells you what is the total uh, amount of uh, uh, work that would be required to be done for a whole aircraft, not by one cylinder, but for the whole aircraft. So, when you put all of them together, you get the total work requirement uh, for the whole aircraft to drive, let us say, a propeller. Now, the, the question here is, uh, let us go back to this pressure, which I have written here as mean effective pressure or M E P. Now, this mean effective pressure is quite often uh, you know is, is average pressure which is operative on this piston during its uh, piston stroke and as a result of which uh, we have what is called and the pressure is actually changing from T D C to B D C as the piston is moving. 
So, uh, a mean effective pressure is defined. It is not one single pressure. It is the mean effective pressure between this point and this point during the traverse of the piston and this is often de defined as uh, mean effective pressure or MEP uh, to uh, facilitate uh, certain amount of computation of the power the, or prediction of the power that can be uh, made from uh, various prior calculations. Now, we shall define the mean effective pressure later on in, uh, in the next lecture in various ways which can be connected to either IHP or what we call BHP and as a result we could have two mean effective pressures uh, indicated mean effective pressure or uh, break mean effective pressure. So, they are two slight different variants of a mean effective pressure and we shall define them appropriately in the next class. So, for a piston engine the increase in mass flow then uh, either you have more number of cylinders or you have higher rpm. So, that the mass flow per uh, unit time is very fast. So, the piston cylinder is uh, you know filled up and exhausted uh, very quickly in very quick succession as a result of which you get uh, more power or you do both. Okay. Um, that means, you have higher rpm and then um, you have higher size. Now, size is restricted. So, some of these things uh, would have to be optimized for every engine that you need to configure. Now, suppose you have an increased rpm to create large mass per unit uh, uh, time. Uh, this will mean that the piston would be moving up and down the length of the cylinder uh, more frequently and as a result of which it will actually encounter more of uh, sliding friction. Uh, as a result of which there will be friction losses which we shall be talking about a little and as a result of which there will be loss of efficiency. That is a mechanical loss uh, and not a thermodynamic uh, item really, but all that has to be considered once you consider how the aircraft engine works. So, there are thermodynamic issues, there are mechanical engineering issues and all of them put together make for an aircraft engine and we shall look into them one by one uh, as we uh, go along. Let us quickly look at some of the thermodynamic issues all over again. We have the real cycle which we had a look at in the last class and <clears throat> we see here that the uh, actual work uh, involves uh, the number of things. We have the heat input here and then the work output here. Now, what happens during the heat input is it is entirely possible that the process of combustion that we are looking at is not a com complete combustion and as a result of it during the process uh, uh, you know uh, 3 to 4 the combustion of fuel is actually incomplete and as a result of which the uh, it does not reach the top value this is what we had seen happens in a real cycle. Okay. Apart from the incomplete combustion, the combustion within the uh, piston engine, if we have a quick look at uh, the volume that is created here at the end of TDC, this is the volume in which the combustion is to be uh, performed, uh, combustion is to be done. It is entirely possible that when the combustion is uh, initiated, it is not uniform around this volume or it is not uniform around the cross section of the piston head and this non uniformity also again leads to certain amount of uh, work done which is uh, less than the ideal amount of work considered. And then we look at the fact that the piston is moving. Now, the movement of the piston of course, uh, entails as I said uh, the mechanical friction loss between the piston uh, and the cylinder body and as a result of which it happens twice once during the power stroke and once during the compression stroke. So, the friction losses would have to be brought into the reckoning uh, while considering the real efficiency of the uh, engine. And then uh, 
larger the engine size that is length and diameter, more is the surface of the friction loss and as a result the higher are the losses. Uh, larger the cylinder size, more are the heat losses through its uh, cylinder surfaces. So, those are the other losses that start coming into the picture now. Now, the cycle efficiency as we have seen is directly influenced by the compression ratio, the pressure ratio and the temperature ratio. Uh, the more the compression ratio or pressure ratio, uh, we have seen the cylinder would not need to be built heavier and uh, these things as I have mentioned are prohibitive. So, if you want to overcome some of the let us say incomplete combustion by building a heavier engine, you really cannot do that because the aircraft uh, requirements uh, puts a uh, uh, prohibition on such increases. Now, the other issue that often uh, occurs in a aircraft is that quite often an aircraft uh, as you know it has to fly which means that it has to take off, it has to climb, it, it goes through a cruise operation and then it has to come back and land. Now, during this entire process of operation the engine has to continuously operate at various operating condition and as a result of which it has to create more power or less power during all these operations. Now, as a result of that the power input uh, to the propeller from the main shaft uh, is finally, the consideration and that is referred to as the brake horse power. That is the power finally, uh, supplied to the propeller. Now, this work done and heat transaction of the engine uh, has to be, it has to be controlled and it has to be changed with the operation of the aircraft and it, it can be changed with the fuel flow into the cylinder. Now, that is the primary control of the engine, the fuel flow and the fuel control provides the engine control primarily. Now, what we can see here from a thermodynamic diagram, uh, a version of the real cycle that we have seen before in the PV diagram, that if you have a, a, a fuel supply that is reduced, the work done will be reduced. So, that is the reduced work done and quite often aircraft could do with reduced power, especially when it is cruising. On the other hand, you may need to have more power when the aircraft is climbing. So, it has to climb from uh, low altitude to high and you would have to pump in more fuel into the cylinder and you would need to get more power. So, as a result of which uh, the piston has to operate with differential or different kinds of fuel flow. Now, the fuel flow that is uh, considered depending on the property of the fuel, most correct is often referred to as the stoichiometric ratio and this is the chemically correct uh, fuel air ratio that needs to be uh, supplied to the engine. It, de it depends on the fuel and every fuel uh, depending on its chemical composition has an identified stoichiometric fuel air ratio. Quite often uh, around this ratio there is a safe uh, fuel air ratio zone that can be identified and the aircraft has to operate within this safe uh, fuel air ratio zone. That means, the reduction of fuel air ratio and the increase of fuel air ratio has to stay within this safe zone, so that the engine continues to operate. If you go outside the zone, the, en uh, the fuel, uh, the engine could actually get uh, uh, blown out. That means, the combustion process could get blown off and the engine would stop operating. Hence, it is necessary that you stay within this fuel air ratio all the time during its entire operation. Now, when we talk about entire operation, we just said that the entire operation means it has to aid the aircraft to fly, it has to take off, it has to climb, it has to cruise and uh, during the World War 1 and 2, many of the aircraft were actually used for military aircraft, military purposes which means they had to do all kinds of maneuvers and during this entire all these maneuvers and finally, landing of course, uh, the engine has to be supplied with fuel in a controlled manner within the stoichiometric ratio defined by the chemical property of the fuel. If you can do that, then the engine is in a position to continuously supply power to the aircraft during its entire flight spectrum. Now, to do that, 
it is necessary then that you supply power within the stoichiometric ratio, which means the engine could be operating uh, under a lean uh, fuel air ratio or a rich fuel air ratio. If it is too lean, it could have a lean blowout. If it is too rich, it could have a rich blowout. So, that is the danger with which I was talking about and you will have no work done out of this cycle. Now, quite often uh, the way the engine is designed and put on an aircraft during its entire cruise, it actually operates at lean fuel air ratio, uh, during which as you can see the fuel uh, consumption would be less, which is good uh, that the amount of fuel carried in aircraft would carry it further. So, engine has to be designed such that during the cruise, it will always operate under lean fuel air ratio. Now, this means that the actual working cycle changes with the fuel air ratio. Each fuel air ratio then actually produces one real cycle and as a result of which one can say that every engine during its entire flight spectrum is operating essentially in a variable cycle manner. That means, the cycle of the engine is actually changing depending on the fuel air ratio and the work done cap capability and hence it effectively becomes a variable cycle engine. So, effectively all engines that are operating on an aircraft and goes through the entire spectrum of flight operates on a essentially variable cycle mode. Of course, there are terms like variable cycle engines which have now uh, many people are trying to develop that means something quite different from what we are talking about what we are talking about is a normal engine put on an aircraft and during its entire process of flying actually undergoes a variable cycle operation. So, this is what we mean at this moment that every engine operates on a variable cycle mode. Let us look at the uh, efficiency that uh, we have talked about. The finally, engine has to uh, fly the aircraft and it has to uh, actually power a propeller. Now, the power developed uh, supplied to the propeller creates a propeller thrust power and this thrust power is what is required by the aircraft. What the engine sur supplies is the engine shaft brake horsepower. This is referred to as BHP and this is available at the end of the shaft. Uh, quite often the shaft operates through a gearbox. So, there is certain amount of loss of power in the gearbox and what is uh, supplied to the propeller is BHP. What is created by the engine is uh, the IHP. So, the ratio of that those two is essentially referred to as the mechanical efficiency of the uh, engine, which is as you, as you see is different from what we had earlier considered the thermal efficiency of the engine which is born out of the thermodynamic considerations. This is the mechanical efficiency of the engine, and but BHP is what the propeller gets and then propeller creates thrust. So, that thrust if you consider uh, into a thrust power, the ratio of the two actually gives you the propeller efficiency. So, we have three efficiencies now, one which we refer to as thermodynamic thermal efficiency now, there is the mechanical efficiency of transmission of power from the engine to the propeller and finally, the propeller efficiency by which the propeller creates thrust. So, at the end of whole th uh, thrust creation, it has to negotiate through three different efficiencies and it is necessary for uh, the aircraft power plant designer to keep in mind that all the three efficiencies need to be as high as possible to get maximum utilization of the power that is being created by the engine. Now, if we look at let us say all over again uh, a typical piston cylinder arrangement. Uh, as we have seen here uh, quickly, uh, the cylinder uh, you know you can have this is the volume of the cylinder which we are talking about and the cylinder is often typified or specified by its volume. And let us say that uh, we have, uh, let us say, six uh, different equal volumes of the cylinder. Uh, you could have cylinders made of uh, 
any of these uh, number of volumes put together. So, more the volume, more is the work capacity of the uh, cylinder as we have seen before. And uh, this is what the initial engine mechanical designer will have to decide what should be the volume of the cylinder which creates the work and as a result of which uh, within which the movement of the piston will have to be restricted. So, movement of the piston is restricted within this and the volume of the cylinder or more specifically the volume of the displacement of the uh, piston is what is to be considered in creating the engine. Uh, so, one could have uh, the volume that is most appropriate or most optimized for a particular kind of aircraft uh, that on which those cylinders would have to be arranged and put together to create an aggregate amount of power. Now, let us look at uh, an, an arrangement of cylinders. Uh, let us take say four cylinders. Uh, the kind of thermodynamic arrangement that we have, we have a uh, uh, four stroke engine. So, let us say that we have four cylinders and uh, to let us look at the four strokes that uh, it has to, to undergo. Now, it is entirely possible that if you have four cylinder arrangement, each of these cylinders could be operating in a time staggered manner that I mentioned earlier. Let us say the first cylinder could be undergoing an air intake stroke, the second cylinder at the same uh, instant could be undergoing a compression stroke, the third cylinder could be undergoing a power stroke and the fourth cylinder would be undergoing the exhaust stroke. So, the time stagger that I was talking about is shown here in this diagram that if you have a, a cylinder arrangement in in line or opposed or uh, x type whatever, uh, you could have them staggered in a manner in such a way that the four strokes that the engines uh, typically undergo uh, can be operated simultaneously through these four cylinders and each of them would be supplying power to the central crankshaft. This is the kind of radial engine that uh, often powers a small aircraft. Now, this is the kind of uh, shape that typically uh, an, a radial engine would have to be housed inside. You would have a, a circular front body of the aircraft within which the radial engine would be housed inside and it would of course, drive the propeller. So, uh, the shape of the aircraft then comes into the picture and we need to understand or need to know what would be the shape of the front part of the aircraft within which the engine would go. And the other consideration as we have mentioned is the aggregate power that is required by the aircraft for uh, flying its uh, passengers or whatever other material that it wants to fly. So, the shape of the front body of the aircraft is what accommodates this radial kind of engine. This is an engine which uh, uh, is nowadays being uh, considered all over again. I mentioned earlier that diesel engine was completely ruled out for uh, aircraft uh, usage. However, very recently some people have started looking at the diesel engine simply because of the thermodynamic consideration that we have talked about that a diesel engine has intrinsically more uh, efficiency, uh, thermal efficiency and that is something which has triggered uh, a recent research in which people have tried to design diesel engine that is light made of light alloys and uses normal aircraft variety of gasoline and it can be, be used to power a propeller. And this is the kind of engine people are now trying to develop to make use of the fundamental thermodynamic consideration that diesel engine are more efficient because of their high compression ratio. This is a, a design of a four cylinder uh, opposed IC engine, which uh, uh, shows the internal uh, parts of the uh, four cylinder IC engine and uh, uh, it, it powers one single crankshaft and uh, powers a uh, propeller. So, this uh, shows all the details of uh, cutout of uh, typical four cylinder opposed IC engine. 
This is a four bladed propeller, piston propeller. You can see here that the shape of the uh, uh, aircraft again has dictated the kind of engine it should use. Uh, one can make a guess that the engine used here is the opposed type, uh, uh, multi cylinder opposed type, probably uh, 3 into 3, that is 6 uh, cylinder in opposed formation, used uh, housed inside this four body of the aircraft powering uh, for four bladed propeller. This is a very famous uh, Spitfire military aircraft used during the Second World War and uh, it is a four bladed uh, propeller. It had uh, engine here which is uh, a big engine probably uh, uh, 8 or 12 cylinders and um, this particular Spitfire military aircraft uh, used the piston prop and as I mentioned military aircraft need to have all kinds of maneuvering capability and as a result of which uh, many of these were uh, configured to have uh, a very good uh, combination of aircraft and engine to aid the aircraft uh, maneuvers. Some of these uh, need to be considered during the uh, choice of the engine or design of the engine itself, uh, so that they provide the continuous power during various maneuvers of the aircraft. This is ex extremely important for aircraft uh, operations. Once the amount of engine power required goes up, we have seen that you could have 6 uh, cylinders, you could have 8 cylinders or you could have 10 cylinders and uh, you could have 12 cylinders and you could have 9 cylinders and you have 9 into 2, 18 cylinders. So, there are uh, engines, piston prop engines where up to 18 cylinders have been put together to uh, power an aircraft. However, if the aggregate power becomes more, uh, it's, it becomes more and more difficult to put together more of these cylinders, in which case uh, one has to look for some other solution, which is uh, not probably uh, piston based. Uh, you need more power, you need to have uh, engine uh, that supplies that power an aircraft engine may not be uh, the piston engine may not be the best aircraft engine in such a circumstances. These are the situations in which you then start looking for other alternatives and that is where the jet engines came in uh, after the uh, second world war when the requirement of power for the aircraft to fly faster, for the aircraft to fly higher and the aircraft to became uh, to become bigger to carry more passengers or more material or uh, uh, more cargo, it required more power and the bigger engines had to be in the not in the form of piston engines, they had to be in the form of uh, gas turbine engines. And these gas turbine based engines are what finally, created today what we call the turboprops. That means, the propellers remained as the thrust making device, but the engine that uh, finally came into being uh, were not the propellers, uh, not the piston uh, engines, but the gas turbine engines. So, the amount of aggregate power that an aircraft uh, needs uh, decides to what extent or to what uh, level you can uh, arrange the piston engines and how many cylinders you can uh, put together. And at the end of the day, if the amount of aggregate power required is more, then you have to go outside the piston engine uh, uh, requirement and you have to look for other kind. So, what is shown here is a turboprop engine which supplies, uh, which is the supplier is a gas turbine engine, but the thruster is still the propeller. However, we will continue to look at various kinds of uh, uh, piston engines and the performances of piston engines in the next class uh, and we shall see how the piston engine performance can be estimated and we shall see the various kinds of ways by which the aircraft engineers have devised methods by which the piston based engines can continue to give good efficiency and good power supply during its flight much of the uh, flight often happens at high altitude and we shall see how aircraft engines are configured to create power at high altitude 
where the air is thin, the density of the air is thin, but the piston engine continues to give uh, good efficiency and good power supply. And we shall look into some of these aspects of uh, engine design in the next class, uh, in which we shall consider the performance of the piston engines as used in aircraft.